the historic and infamous Roe versus Wade decision is now 20 years old. In its wake lay 28 million slaughtered innocents. Today we would like to discuss its social and moral consequences. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. You know, back in uh, November of 1992, there was a story that was carried in the major newspapers of the world which understandably shocked people. The story was, quote, satanic cult resorts to human sacrifice in Brazil. And the article went on to present in rather striking detail what these devil worshipers did to a small child. Now, understandably, people were shocked. I'd like to show you a picture now, which if you are sensitive to that, these type of things, I'd like to warn you, it's a picture of an aborted baby. I dare say that what was done to this baby was far more horrible than what was done to that child in Brazil. And yet, in general, people in this country say that was a good thing. With me today to discuss 20 years of Roe versus Wade are Daniel Laporte, an Akron, Ohio attorney who's active prominently in the Right to Light movement, and Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Therese of the Child Jesus Church and publisher and editor of the Roman Catholic Magazine. Dan, uh, we have kind of a striking development uh, which I think has, breaks all ties to tradition where the post-Vatican II bishops are now promoting laws which permit some abortion. In the past, this would have been unheard of. What effect does this have? And can you give us some specific instances? Well, that's true, Julius. <coughs> I can think of uh, at least uh, two cases in which that was the case. Uh, in the state of Louisiana in 1991, the Right to Life movement had the power in the state legislature to pass a law which would have prohibited all abortions except in the case of the endangering of the mother's life. Um, they had the votes to pass that. The Catholic hierarchy in Louisiana, however, uh, insisted that the bill uh, that was passed uh, had, in fact, many more exceptions to it, the rape exception, the uh, incest uh, exception, and so forth. That was the bill that was, in fact, passed in Louisiana. Uh, it was very discouraging to the uh, pro-life forces in uh, Louisiana, and in fact, the Louisiana statute as passed uh, was uh, overturned by the Circuit Court of Appeals down there. As being too restrictive. That's right. Uh, also in the state of Connecticut, the uh, Catholic bishops backed a, a type of Freedom of Choice Act, which uh, they even co-opted the uh, right to life forces in Connecticut into backing, which in fact permits uh, abortion on demand in uh, the state of Connecticut with no objection whatsoever. It's very discouraging to have that type of support, as it were. Father Jenkins, why is it that, uh, I mean, this is a very basic question, I guess, but something which needs to be addressed. Why is abortion wrong in all circumstances, even, say, in the case of the endangerment of a mother's life? Because it is murder. It is the direct destruction of innocent human life, which is the very definition of murder. Uh, it is never permitted to directly uh, destroy an innocent life, innocent human life. Um, I use the word directly because sometimes it is permissible morally to perform an action which in itself is not bad, which can have two effects, two consequences. Uh, one of them good and one of them bad. The bad effect is kind of a byproduct, an, an involuntary thing, but it, it is unavoidable. And the principle of double effect, or what in Latin is called the voluntarium indirectum, sometimes permits that, permits a, a good act to be done, even though uh, something bad is caused at the same time. Um, but you see, uh, it seems that uh, the bishops uh, of the Vatican II Church in this country uh, are using that idea to justify morally the support of legislation uh, which permits exceptions in, uh, in banning abortion. 
uh, they, they come up with, I, I understand what they call, imperfect legislation by which they say, well, we're going to uh, use this legislation, even though it's not perfect, to save some of the children, uh, even though we can't save all of them. Now, this sounds good to some people because they would say, well, of course, if we can save some, even though we can't save all, at least that's better than none. Um, but they have to put this in perspective by, by asking themselves real questions, not just theoretical questions. For example, uh, this country was just in a furor over the, the, the question of m those missing in action, the MIAs, being left behind in uh, Vietnam. And uh, the country was so upset about this because uh, we found out that uh, our uh, government officials knew there were thousands of American servicemen left behind in Vietnam, and, uh, and they simply abandoned them there. The reason why people were so upset about that is because they say you cannot make a deal whereby you're just going to save some and then tacitly acknowledge that uh, the others are, we're just going to forget about. We're just going to abandon. You can't do that. If, if any one of our government officials had come out some years ago when the whole question of the uh, POWs, the Vietnamese POWs, were going to be, uh, was going to be resolved and said, look, we have so many thousands of servicemen being held captive by the uh, communist Viet Vietnamese, and they're not going to release them all. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, give us 2,000 of them and keep the rest. The country would have been in flames if they had suggested this. But this is the same approach that the, the bishops seem to be using and those who are promoting this so-called imperfect legislation uh, and saying, well, look, we can't save them all, so we're going to negotiate a settlement over the lives of these children. As soon as you do that, you destroy the whole principle. Either that's a human being or, you're, or it's not. And if it is a human being, as human as those servicemen who were left behind in Vietnam, the unborn child is a human being as much as they were, then you can't negotiate over their lives. And uh, you have to maintain the principle that to directly kill one of them is murder and we're not going to negotiate over the murder of a single child. When you do that, when you start negotiating over how many they can kill and how many you can save, you have just in principle murdered them all because you've declared all of their lives negotiable. Dan, uh, one thing which I think has been pretty striking is the following. Uh, certainly there are some modern bishops who oppose abortion Notable example is Bishop Austin Vaughn, who's even gone on rescue missions. Uh, at the same time, there are some bishops who have pro-choice sympathies. Uh, other bishops have uh, seminaries in their diocese where theologians teach that uh, abortion is justifiable in many circumstances. But the most striking thing, I believe, is that uh, there are many examples of aggressively pro-choice Catholic legislatures or uh, laymen who promote this idea and yet nothing is done. Nothing is done to discipline them. How has this affected the right to life movement and what is the, from your perspective the rationale behind this? Well it's, it's <coughs> of course difficult uh, to uh, actively uh, promote the right to life um, within the Catholic Church when the Catholic bishops fail to discipline uh, so-called pro-choice Catholic legislatures. Uh, it simply takes the heart out of the movement and you're constantly faced with other Catholics being influenced by that. Um, it's, it's something that, that uh, has to be stopped if we're ever going to be successful. You know, it's even more striking too, another consequence is, you know, how, what is the degree of resolve of the post-Vatican II hierarchy in opposing abortion? Most, almost all surveys indicate throughout the world in the United States that the overwhelming majority of Catholics support abortion in some circumstances. And I think even 30 days, Father, we had a magazine we saw that said only 10 percent of American Catholics were against uh, abortion in all circumstances. In all circumstances exactly. I mean, who's responsible for this? And, and what does this do to the claim that all of the bishops and, you know, are militantly against abortion? I think the reason uh, why you have this sad state of affairs is simply that 
uh, although the uh, bishops make these very grandiose statements against abortion, they uphold, as it were, on the other hand, the almost untrammeled right of each individual Catholic to form his own conscience, but they do that without any guidance being given to Catholics beyond these broad statements. Um, you will find that whenever the bishops do speak on this subject and on the subject of Catholics voting, they will make statements, as the Catholic bishops in Ohio did in 1989, that the only votes they, referring to the bishops' control, are their own votes and they rely upon Catholics forming their own consciences, and yet you never hear sermons on this subject in the, in the conciliar churches on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Very okay. rarely. A pro-life leader was telling me recently that the bishops are, are in the back pocket, so to speak, of, of the radical feminists mm -hmm. who, are, who come on very strong with them and have a tremendous amount of influence over them. Mm -hmm. And uh, But this uh, pro-life leader, as they say, was saying that uh, once the bishops uh, decipher that there is a n large number of, of uh, you know, wanted Catholic people, they're following the new religion, but they want to be Catholic, a large number of Catholic people out there who want them to stand up against abortion, then they will do so. And this person was telling me that uh, in the early years of uh, pro-life activity, the bishops did not really support them that much. In fact, the bishops uh, gave them as uh, pro-lifers as hard a time as many of the more liberal congressmen, brushing them off and giving them absolutely no, uh, no attention whatsoever, no consideration whatsoever. But now that there's been an enormous groundswell among the more conservative members of the Novus Ordo Church that came out of Vatican II, these bishops are beginning to come forward. And uh, this person was telling me that once they, once they discover this, uh, the lay people are going to influence them, and then they will speak up. And my point was, these men are supposed to be the successes of the apostles, supposed to be. They're supposed to be the leadership. If they need the lay people to give them the confidence to step forward, or even the, the, the principle, the gumption to step forward, then the, even when they do step forward, their leadership will be worth nothing because it could evaporate just as easily as it, as it condensed in the first place. Uh, I, we, we have to pray seriously for these men, but I don't think we can rely on them to, to form real leadership. Even You mentioned uh, Bishop Austin Vaughan, who has shown a certain amount of courage in this effort and has inspired a lot of uh, Novus Ordo Catholics uh, to think that, yes, there is hope for, for the hierarchy, but even he, I understand, supports this imperfect legislation idea of negotiating a settlement over who will, well, some of the babies living and some of the babies dying. You're watching what Catholics believe we're uh, I'm just uh, fascinated by this question, and maybe not fascinated because it, it's certainly turning our society in kind of a, into a kind of a nightmare world. Uh, there seems to be increasingly a tremendous cheapening of the value of human life, a kind of brazenness, a kind of desensitivity to, to the value of uh, the sacredness of human life. Just the other day I read in the paper where two girls aged 12 and 13 were conspiring to kill their seventh grade teacher because one of the teacher gave the girl a mild rebuke saying, you know, you should pay more attention in class. And they came within two minutes of, or just a few moments of successfully pulling off this crime. Uh, later, the police could not believe that they showed no remorse at all when they were taken to the police station. Incredible callousness. My question is, to what extent is abortion responsible for this, where we've now killed 28 million babies in this country, and that's a good thing, it's a right, and you dare not oppose it, or you're branded as being intolerant and, and, a, and a criminal. Is that, what is the relationship between this abortion mentality and these senseless crimes which we see today? I think that uh, there's, there's a direct relationship. It's part of the increasing violent nature of our society. Um, violence is condemned even by the liberal element in our society, but they do not realize that when 4,000 unborn children are aborted every day, that that is just another example of the cheapening of human life. And there's nothing, I think, that increases the aspect of violence in our society than abortion on demand. Because uh, 
The unborn child is so helpless. Uh, I mean, the, the, even the soldiers left behind in Vietnam uh, still had hope. I mean, they could, they could try to escape or, you know, they had hope that their government would remember them and come back for them or there would be a groundswell of support from this country among the, uh, the populace. But, uh, you know, the unborn child is so, is so helpless. It just increases the enormity of the crime, no. uh, especially when it is done by the will of the mother. Uh, there, there is no love that is naturally more uh, forceful than the love of a mother for her child. Mothers are, are supposed to, by nature, be willing to defend their children with their own lives. And for a mother to turn on her own child and say, you are in my way and I'm going to destroy you, is so evil that it just makes the, the uh, well, you mentioned the callousness, but the malice involved goes beyond the, the, the malice in these young teenagers you were telling, talking about a moment ago. As bad as their malice is, and as shocking as it is, that they would callously plot the murder of a teacher for having issued a mild rebuke to one of them, is nothing compared to the evil of a mother determining to destroy her own child because that child happens to be in her way. You know, you mentioned earlier, Julius, that only uh, 10, somewhere between 10 and 13 percent of the modern Catholics in this country oppose abortion in all circumstances. That's according to some recent polls. That means, uh, well, let's say they're an equal number, maybe 10 percent who say abortion should be okay in all circumstances. And in the middle you have 75, maybe 80 percent of the, of the <coughs> Novus Ordo Catholic people who evidently believe there's something wrong with it, but as uncomfortable as they are about it and as lamentable as they believe it is, they're willing to protect the so-called right to have one because of the, the so-called hard cases. Um, when a woman really does have a serious problem. And let's say, in a few cases, it might not even be her fault, you know, in a few cases, uh, when she's the, the victim of some aggression. And they're willing to allow, to sit back and watch this happen. 4,000 children being put to death every day for the sake of these handful of exceptions that they think are insoluble. They see abortion in these cases as being the lesser of two evils. It's not. It is the worst evil. It is worse than a mother having a child by virtue of her having, herself having been violated. The, the evil of some woman having been violated and having to bear the child is, is bad. It's, it's, it's a crime. The individual who did that to her should be executed not just put in jail, he should be executed for that crime against her. But the child cannot be executed. That is an innocent life. And uh, as, as difficult as it is for her, and as, as much compassion as we must show her, and as much help as we must give her for that, it, it does not justify in any way her taking that child's life. It is not the lesser of two evils to destroy the child. The, the, the lesser of two evils is to let the child live, to take care of the child. The child's life is not an evil thing. It is a good thing in itself. Abortion is the evil, and there is no way to make abortion the lesser of any two evils. I'd like to mention to our viewer, uh, Father, viewers, Father Jenkins, that we have a policy. If uh, anyone has uh, problems with the pregnancy and they're under pressures to have it terminated, we're there to help. Uh, they could call us and we'll try to arrange for support either in terms of adoption. We've done this in the past. We've had uh, programs in the past in abortion where we've had people call in saying they were on the process of going to have an abortion and they saw the program and they stopped. So we're there to help. If you have problems, please let us know. We'll do our best to help you. Uh, you know, to me, the one thing which I'm, I'm constantly amazed at is that we have these very liberal people who will actually shed tears over the slaying of baby seals. And yet, if you somehow say that abortion on demand should be restricted, they will become violently angry uh, with you. Uh, we have a situation where Justice Harry Blackman is in, in general considered a national hero, and I think I'd like to make a very moderate statement about that. He's one of the worst mass murderers of all history, and he's a hero. We have a president now who favors the brutal dismemberment 
of children, unborn children. He is a hero. What does that tell us about the condition of modern man's soul, that they can look upon this thing and consider it a good thing? And if God punished uh, nations in the Old Testament for transgressions of his law, what is in store for us? I would think uh, a great deal of retribution is in store for us. You mentioned Justice Blackman. Uh, however, um, an example, a prime example of the failure of the conciliar church to adequately uh, teach its faithful is represented in the Casey uh, versus Planned Parenthood decision in Pennsylvania that the Supreme Court decided on June 26th Maybe of last year. Maybe you could tell year. us about that. Yeah, it was a five to four verdict. It was a five to four decision and the swing vote was cast by Arthur Kennedy who invariably in the news media is portrayed as a devout Catholic. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, reasons why he was proposed to the High Court by President Reagan was that he had done pro bono work for the United States Catholic Conference. In 1989 or 1988, he was on the pro-life side in the Webster decision. He, d he voted with the Chief Justice. In the spring of last year, in the initial conference on the Casey decision, he was with the Chief Justice and there were five votes to overturn Roe v. Wade. And yet, for some unknown reason, he switched his vote, he cast his vote with the so-called uh, conservative majority of uh, Justices Souter and, and uh, the uh, uh, Justice from Arizona. Uh, O'Connor. O'Connor. And now we have a really a more flagrant version of abortion on demand because the theory of that case, which he helped to write, shifted from uh, the right of privacy to a liberty right under the 14th Amendment. And the danger of that is that Congress can enforce liberty rights under the 14th Amendment by legislation. So uh, we don't know what happened. We heard uh, through rumor in the District of Columbia that uh, pro-abortion Catholic nuns had written to Justice Blackman and implored him to uphold Roe v. Wade and that through the law clerk system at the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Kennedy came in and saw those and this may have been one of the reasons why he switched his vote. Hmm. Julius, the only solution <coughs> to this problem is going to be one that uh, affects the morals of the people of this country. The, the reason we're even discussing this problem now is because the people do not seem to be able to understand that there are moral absolutes, there are rights and there are wrongs and there are wrongs that you can never make right under any circumstances. Abortion is one of them. They look at the hard cases and they say, well, if I were in this situation, I would sure like to at least have the opportunity to resolve the problem in this way. And they feel, and even if I personally wouldn't, I can understand why someone would. And that's why we have this horrible slaughter going on. But if somehow you could get through to the people's minds and consciences the idea that there are some things that are simply wrong under any circumstances, all those people who still believe in a God, a personal God, should be able to understand that. But there's a blindness that has settled over them. And the only way to remove that blindness and get them out of that, that dense, immoral, liberal fog is by prayer. And uh, we've been uh, marching and, and chanting slogans and waving placards for 20 years now. And look where it's gotten us. Worse than ever. Clinton in the White House. <laughs> and uh, looking at legislation coming down the pike that is really bad. And, but we have to get down on our knees and beg God to please spare us this and to deliver our country from this horrible, horrible thing. Um, I would like uh, what Catholics believe to issue a national call through this program uh, to beg people to take this February 24th uh, or this upcoming Ash Wednesday as a day of fast and prayer. Fast one full meal and two meals which together do not equal the main meal. No flesh meat whatsoever, abstinence from meat. And in addition to that, praying the 15 decades of the rosary on that day and do this specifically in reparation to God for the crime of abortion throughout our land and to offer it in particular for those who are responsible for it. 
Uh, this, I think, our program can do. This we should do. And I'd like the people who see this program, who are willing to do this and join us in this effort, to call in and tell us, yes, I will observe the fast, and I will pray 15 decades of the rosary on Ash Wednesday, specifically in reparation, and I will offer those prayers for God's mercy on our land and on those who are responsible for this crime. You've been watching what Catholic...